Emory is going to read our scripture passage for today, which is Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. And I invite you, if you are able, to stand for the reading of God's word. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Amen. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, it is a consequential weekend. It's a high Sabbath, so to speak, as we're called to remember the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Father, I feel completely inadequate for the task of preaching your words on such a holy day. So take me away from this place and take each one who has come to hear away from this place and you stand and sit in our stead so that your words will be spoken, your words will be heard, and you as the king of our hearts will leave this place to lead us into all righteousness every day until we can meet Jesus in the air. Bless us with forgiveness now. Take away that which separates us from you and anoint everyone in this room that we may receive that for which you have called us here in the first place. Amen. All right, another, another freebie for you is, um, I assume you know prophetically that Easter is really just Passover. If you didn't know that, now you do. So the word Easter shows up in one version of the Bible one time. It's one time in the book of Acts in the King James Version, and that's it. And the reason it does not appear in any other translations is because it's not a biblical word. Even in the book of Acts, the word that's translated into Easter, the actual Greek word is Pesach, Passover, right? So I really struggled. What do I, what do I tell you about today? Passover, right? Christ our Passover, I think, is the number one sermon to preach on this weekend. But I've already preached it to you twice in my tenure here. Um, so... I figured if you really need to hear it, you can just go to YouTube and hear it again. So I'll bring something new. But the point is, I created a one-page um, handout for you with the kind of Old Testament Passover type and the New Testament anti-type in Christ. And that should be available for you on the way out after this sermon. So hope, hopefully that will be edifying to you. All right, for today, not the nails. I, I assume you know what really kept Jesus on the cross, right? Because it wasn't the nails. <laughs> That's right. And we're going to talk about that today through Romans chapter 5. This is a really interesting passage um, written in Paul's unique style where he kind of meanders. But as is typical with Paul's writings, there's often a lot more to talk about than the surface level of the words that he uses. And we might see some of that today. Verse six sets up the topic. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. What does that mean to you that he came in due time to do this? All right, one at a time, Dorothy. When he was prophesied to come, he showed up at the right time. That's right. But also there's more, too. 
That's the correct answer, but think about it. Why was it the right time? <laughs> yeah, but that's kind of a circular argument, isn't it? <laughs> it's the right time because it was prophesied to be the right time? I mean, what was going on in the world that made it the right time? Why did God choose that moment in time to send Jesus, to prophesy hundreds of years ahead of time? What was going on? Say, what? Okay, yes. Uh, and the Romans did kind of level that up, but the Persians actually created crucifixion. Um, and on the one hand, you'd say the Persians did it worse because they'd essentially just like stick you on a pole and leave you there till you died. But the Romans actually did it worse <laughs> because they installed a little seat on the cross. <laughs> It's ostensibly because, you know, it's far too painful to hang your entire body weight on nails through your wrists. And so you can sit down a little bit. But the practical effect of that is that it takes you like four times longer to die on the, on the cross that way. And so the Romans did this on purpose to maximize your pain and maximize your humiliation. Um, certainly that's part of it. Christ had to die in a specific way, and we had to wait until the moment in time when that was so commonplace that no one would have thought any different about it. But along those same lines, I'm going to suggest the entirety of planet Earth was made ripe just for that moment. And here's what I mean. Have you ever struggled to figure out how the same God who tells you to turn your other cheek and love your enemies can also manifest in the book of Joshua saying, go destroy everybody who's here. Yep, exactly. Have you ever struggled to reconcile those two pictures of God into one God? I'm going to try to help you right now, okay? The book of Joshua shows us what God has to do when the world is at war, when he has that need to protect his people, okay? That's the goal for God, always protect his own people so that Jesus will eventually be born through that people. And when they're surrounded on all sides by pagans and warlords and violence everywhere, God has to step into that and behave as he does to get the, the, the wickedness away. What was different when Jesus walked the world? than it was in the book of Joshua. True. That's not where I'm going, though. I'm thinking more in terms of violence. If Joshua is what happens when God has to step into violence, then how did Jesus manifest as totally different than that in the Roman Empire? All right, I'm going to give you two words, okay? Pax, P-A-X, Romana. What's the Pax Romana? The Roman peace. How did Rome achieve peace? By stepping on everybody else, right. By crushing everybody into dust and then crucifying all the survivors for miles on every single road away from what had just happened to make sure everybody knew what happens when you cross Rome. Absolutely. Very good, Michael. That's right. Nice country you got here. It'd be a shame if something happened to it. Yeah. Um, that's right. The Pax Romana. It has its own name because it's an anomaly in history. It's an anomaly when the entire world goes quiet from warfare all at once. You can kind of say that for the last couple generations, we've been living in the Pax Americana from like World War II until the horrific... Afghanistan withdrawal a couple years back, right? But my point is, how can God show up and say, love your enemies when you've got 15 enemies ready to kill you? He can't. He has to behave like he does in the book of Joshua in that circumstance. In order for Jesus to come and show us the Father, the way that we understand that through the Gospels, the world had to be at peace. Do you see where I'm going with this? 
in due time, in the fullness of time, Christ died for the ungodly. In the fullness of time when the Father had moved every piece on planet Earth like a chessboard so that the circumstances were exactly right to allow the Father who loves beyond measure to be manifest in the world. In the fullness of time, in due time, Christ came to show us what heaven is like in a way that he could not have done while the Persians were in control, or the Babylonians were in control, or the Greeks were in control, or the Americans were in control for that matter. He needed that moment in time. Furthermore, the Roman history was such that it was already on the decline. The Pax Romana, like the American Romana, <laughs> the Pax, Pax Americana, that's what I meant to say, um, indicates a society in decline. You've already reached your apex. You're fat and happy and lazy, as our Sabbath school teacher told us this morning. And whatever you did to create that society in the first place is not going to be what you do once you have achieved the apex. And so Rome is already on its way out. Christ knows this. He's showing the world a different way so that when it's Rome's time to go away, the world has a new power. You, I mean, you ever notice Daniel 2, no one comes after Rome? It's because it's the kingdom of God that comes after Rome, right? Christ came to show us what heaven is like when Rome goes away. In any case, in the fullness of time, Christ died. And that is a profound statement because there was nothing accidental about that time at all. Verse 7, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. And yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. <laughs> Does this verse ever trip you up? We kind of, I mean, our society has fallen so far away from God that even within the church, we're often terrified of death, aren't we? It's a rarity when we have a, a church member or a loved one or whatnot, and they're very, very ill or they're kind of whatever, they're facing death for a different reason, and then we all gather together to pray, what do we usually pray? We usually, well, I would love for us to pray that God's will be done, but most of the time we pray for healing, as if that's what God is always interested in, right? I read Isaiah 57 verses 1 and 2, and I am told that God is not always interested in healing. Sometimes he allows death as a mercy. But we have fallen so far away as a society that even within the church, we are scared of death and we always pray for death to go away, even when that is not what God wants. So this verse should make absolutely no sense to us from our modern 21st century American perspective. Name me someone in your life for whom you are willing to die. My kids, okay. That was about the only answer I was expecting to hear. Yeah. Anybody else? My spouse. My spouse? I would ask the married people in the room how many people agree with that, but I don't want to hear the answer. <laughs> the Bible tells us, for a righteous man, for a man, a person, who is way up here on the list of goodness, even then, scarcely, hardly ever, will somebody be willing to die for that person. And yet, perhaps, in certain circumstances, someone may be a little bit farther down on the list of goodness. You're not quite righteous, but you're maybe just kind of good. Maybe, just maybe, for that person, you're willing to give up your life. Your kids, your spouse, not on this list. So clearly, clearly way back then they had a, um, a more familiar relationship with death than we do, right? We just are terrified of it. But he says, now in certain circumstances, you probably are willing to lay down your life, but only in these extreme circumstances for super, super good people. Therefore, verse 8 stands in stark contrast to that. For God demonstrates his own love toward us in that 
while we were still sinners. Are you righteous when you're a sinner? Are you good when you are a sinner? I believe Romans 3 says, there is none righteous. No, not one. And so from our point of view, maybe just maybe if you're righteous enough, maybe I'll consider dying for you. But Christ says, while you hate me, while you spit on me, while you reject me, while you ignore me, while you hear what I say and then go do exactly the opposite, while you were in that condition, while you were happy to drive nails through my hands and feet and mock me while I died, I died for you. Which is not something any one of us would do. I love that you're not even arguing the point. <laughs> There's no argument, right? Of course not. Not a single one of us wakes up thinking, you know, if somebody just beats me to a pulp today and like disrespects me and burns down my house and kills my whole family, I think maybe, just maybe, I'm going to preach that guy into the kingdom by letting him kill me. Right? Right. No. Right. That's not how we work. But that's why God is different from us. Right? Amen. One of the worst things we can do is to put humanity on God. Okay? God is wholly different from us. Thank God. Yes. <laughs> While we were still sinners. All right, verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. I love paying attention to verb tenses with Paul. Because, I mean, in English it's profound, but in Greek, you don't even really change the word. You just change like the, the suffix on the end of the word and it means something totally different. It's incredible. And so he's saying, having now been past tense, since the justification already happened through the blood of Jesus Christ, therefore, future tense, we shall be saved from wrath through him. He's setting up a temporal difference between justification and ultimate salvation. Does that cause anybody any trouble? John says the same thing, verse 12. But as many as received him, Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God. You ever notice that? He doesn't say as many as received him became children of God. He says receiving Jesus gives you the right to become something else. But it doesn't mean it happens automatically. To those who believe in his name, and then he expands on that in verse 13, what does it mean to be a children of God, to be a child of God? Well, if you were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Your birth may have come from your mother, because otherwise you wouldn't be here, right? But your rebirth comes from God. That's what it means. Now, I assume in your lives you have met people who claim the name of Jesus, but that's, that's the, extent to, the extent to which you can see Jesus in their lives. That's it, right? The words they use, and that's it. Those people are demonstrating this issue. As many as who receive him have the right to become something else. Do we want to capitalize on the rights that God gives us? I do too, brother. You've noticed over the past several years that the rights that we have enjoyed legally, secularly speaking, seem to be going away. I'm just going to wade into current events just for a second because it's not the point, but it's a good illustration. You're aware the former president was arrested? Yep. 
a sitting lawmaker said about that arrest that he had the burden of proving his innocence. Where are the Americans in the room? It is backwards, isn't it? You're innocent until proven guilty. That is your right as an American. But not in the 21st century, is it? Now, granted, the American government and the heavenly government, not the same thing and they're not related to each other. Nonetheless, I believe things happen on earth because they first happen in heaven. I think the earthly things happen as a result of spiritual things happening first. So when we see all around us this push away from the God-given rights that we've known and enjoyed, well, are we not talking about a God-given right to become a child of God? So as long as we're in the mentality of my rights don't matter, your rights don't matter, rights are not a real thing, then why would we be mentally inclined to take up on the rights that God gives us? All right, the last verse of our scripture passage. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. There's again that disconnect between past tense salvation and future tense salvation. That means when you come to Jesus one time, you better stay with Jesus until the end. Amen? You think there will be people who come to Jesus once and then walk away before the end? Depart from me, I never knew you. Right? So what are we getting from Romans here? We're getting a picture of the love of God that should actually challenge us. <laughs> Through all of this imagery that we're given, it should challenge us in a number of different ways. The love of God is so great that nothing else matters, and yet the love of God still opens up our freedom of choice. I can take God up on his right to make me something greater, but I don't have to, do I? I can choose to act in grace toward my enemies to be Christian, not just in word, but in deed. But do I have to? Nope. I can make that choice to say no. I can make that choice to not actually live the way that Christ wants me to. This here, this is from where the sermon title comes. And I think this is such a profound idea that like the nails holding Jesus to the cross, this idea should hold us to Jesus. Because when we look unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, that's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning of it and also the end of it, he's the whole thing, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. You know the word excruciating? Yep, you know that word refers to crucifixion? Excruciating has the same, same root. The point is, the experience on the cross was so diabolically horrific that it needs its own word to describe. Other words don't do it justice to describe what happens on the cross. And the scripture tells us that in that paradigm, where his body is being ripped apart from the inside out, he feels joy. He endured the cross. He despised the shame. Despised the shame. What do you think that even means? How do you despise shame? All right, he's broken, he's beaten, he's probably naked. Yeah. Yes, he, and yet he despised that shame. It doesn't say he, he endured the cross, 
But it doesn't say he endured the shame. It says he despised the shame. It's gross. It was like an enemy in between him and his goal. He's not accepting the shame, is, it? is he? No way. Nope. He accepted my sin. He accepted death on the cross. He did not accept that shame. He despised that shame. It had nothing to do with that moment and what was going on. He despised it. He said, this is not why I'm on the cross. I'm on the cross because of the joy that is before me. And he therefore rose from the grave, ascended to heaven, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You already know the answer to this, but what was that joy that was set before him for which he endured the cross and despised the shame? Life eternal eternal with whom? With you. That's right. With you, with you, with you, with me. He thinks that you are worth excruciating pain. I'm not even going to go into the details of what happens during crucifixion. There are kids in the room. That's not why you came to church today. But let me promise you, the more you study this, the closer to vomiting you're going to feel. It is just horrific. It is ugly. It's gross. It makes the worst horror movie you have ever seen look like The Wizard of Oz. It is just, it's ridiculously awful. And he said, I don't care. I see the joy on the other end of it. He says, you are worth it. And so are you. So how do I drive a point home to a room full of Seventh-day Adventists? How do you think God can hold out a right for you, but you don't take it? Practically speaking, how might you look at the right to become a child of God and say, no thanks? What would that look like in your life? Foolishness. Foolishness? Okay, define that for me, brother. Insanity. Can you give me a specific example? I am thinking of a specific, common example of how we actually despise the cross. Turning down the most wonderful gift I could ever be given for nothing. <laughs> how about when we try to do things our, our way and forgetting what he said? And what is his way? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift from God. How much do you pay for gifts? And then in case verse 8 didn't do it for you, Paul gives us verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. And women are included in that too. (laughs) Jeff, go ahead. Amen. You can't contain the gift that God has given to you without sharing it with somebody else. Amen. All right, I see a strong push for witnessing there. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You, you, you don't want to hold to yourself that which God has given you. And I would say you need the regenerated heart to do that, right? You're not going to be preaching the kingdom of heaven with your earthly heart. No. Becky. I Amen. And we seem to want it, oh, we don't want to look silly for other people. And I think that's another, you know, I, some of the choices in my life I've made is like, oh, other people are like, that's stupid. And yeah, it probably is to a man's eye. But it, it, it's something in the way you think things through is God's way, not necessarily our way. And there has to be that faith element there. I love that. 
and God's way versus our way is a common theme of the answers I've been receiving. And my point is God has already told us the way of salvation. Often we don't like that because we feel like we're not doing enough, right? I need to show up and do something for my salvation. And so I'm not saying we choose bad things. We often choose good things, right? I'm going to return a proper tithe and have a good worship life and do worship with my kids and eat a good diet and live uprightly and be honest. And all these, these are good things, right? Yeah, but you're missing the point. But you're missing the point because the point is what, Stanley? Drive it home for me. What's the point? What's the point we're missing when we do those things? We're missing the point that it's what he does for us, not it's because it's what he does for us, not what we do for him. If you think that you are the one holding up God, then you will forever live in fear of letting him down. But if you realize from the beginning, you're not the one holding him up and therefore can never be responsible for letting him down, there's freedom there. So I have one more thought to share before I close here. We shall be saved by his life. The closing part of Romans 5, verse 10. We shall be saved by his life. Rather than ask you what that means, I'm just going to tell you what, how I interpret that. And that's out of Jeremiah chapter 13 that I'm thinking. We shall be saved by his life. The context of this is that we were once enemies. And then Christ died for us in this illogical way. And something changes because of his death. And be, therefore, we will be saved by his life. Okay. So the thing that changes is we're not enemies with him anymore. Right? What changes in your life? Is it not your heart that changes? Whereas, and the example I always give is in my youth, my college days, you've, some of you have heard this before, I know, but in my college days, I lived in New York City and I had an anger problem and everybody was in my way all the time and I hated them just because they were in my way. Simultaneously, I never was early anywhere because your time wasn't worth my time. And if you weren't going to start on time, then I was going to show up late. You know, that kind of a thing. It was, it was horrible and it was, it was arrogant and, and it was nothing good about it because my heart was wrong. I met Jesus through the Sabbath and the Sabbath tells me God created everything and everyone. And therefore, you, Stanley, you're not my generation. You and I have lived very different lives. We have probably very little in common when you get down to like the nitty gritty. And yet, you are worth just as much to God as I am. Whoa, that would like blew my mind when that occurred to me like that. You mean this, this guy who's, who's making me late is valued by God enough to die for him? Well, if you're of infinite value in the sight of God, then like I, I don't have the right to treat you this way. I don't have the right even to feel this way about you. Change in my heart. So out of Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23, scripture says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? Then, meaning when those things happen, then you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. Scripture says the natural heart has no more ability to turn into a good heart than your skin has the ability to change its own color. So therefore, if we have this promise out of Romans 5 that through something that we don't do, through something that Jesus did way before we were even conceived, conceived. yes, that was a nice, succinct, church-appropriate way to say that, yes, that that's going to be the miracle that Jeremiah 13 says is, is impossible. That means we need to leave here today claiming that right from God to be a child of God 
and asking him to do the miracle that Paul is talking about in Romans 5 here. To overcome this problem from Jeremiah 13 and actually make my heart good. To change me from the inside out so that I don't look at you with hatred anymore and I don't look at you with impatience anymore and I don't look at you with my own selfish ideas anymore because I recognize that Jesus died for you too even though you were an enemy to him and maybe you still are. That's our Resurrection Day message this year. I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring it back to salvation. If you know that you're not right with God, the natural impulse is to start doing all the right things for God. And while that is a good thing to do, of course, we want to do the good things for God. That is in and of itself, not what God is looking for. God wants a heart surrender to Jesus Christ because of the simple fact that you don't deserve God's love and he gives it to you anyway. That means the worst thing you ever did was just what God needed to drive you to the foot of the cross. And how many of us walk through our lives under perpetual condemnation from our own selves about something we did 5, 10, 20, 30, 50 years ago that we'll never ever allow ourselves to forget when the only thing Jesus wants us to do is to surrender at the foot of the cross. Are you ready to surrender to Jesus today? This wasn't the picture that I was looking for when I was going through my pictures. But knowing that I started with the Pax Romana, I thought this is just like a perfect way to end. Rome itself was contrary to God in just about every single way. So for an individual Roman to kneel at the foot of the cross, It's like the centurion represented the entire kingdom in that moment. Surrendering at the foot of the cross. And once you surrender, it's only a matter of time before you're defeated, right? <laughs> so when Rome surrenders, it's only a matter of time before it's not there anymore. Let's surrender today, friends. Not that I want you to go away, but we all should want the natural versions of ourselves to go away, right? And let's let Christ live in our hearts from this moment on. And celebrate his life, amen? Because since he rose from the grave, that means we too can rise from the grave of our mistakes and the grave of our sin and the grave of our natural lives. Amen? So we have a closing song today. I'm going to ask you to, one more question, but the closing song is um, Christ the Lord is risen today. It's a triumph song. Let's sing it to recognize not only did he rise from the grave, but because he did that, we too can rise from the grave, future tense, and even right now. Amen? You want to experience a resurrection today? You want to finally step into that paradigm God promised you, offered you, to be a son or a daughter of God from this moment forward? Is that your desire today?